Welcome everybody to a thrilling Friday morning discussion around tax considerations for dental practices. Uh, my name is Scott Haberman and I'm a tax senior manager out of our Fort Collins, Colorado office. Um, and Stacy, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Stacy Erdman out of the Sioux Falls, South Dakota office. I am a tax partner and get to deal a lot with dental practices and really kind of enjoy it. So we're excited to get to share some information with you guys today. All right. So uh, kicking it off, head back to our disclosure. Um, so you can't trust anything we say is what this disclaimer is, uh, is noting. Uh, so consult your tax advisor. Um, you know, everyone has their particular situation is applicable to them. And so just make sure that, uh, you know, this, some of this might be helpful to you, but confirm with your, your advisor. So we're gonna talk about some of the compliance considerations for dental practices, such as structuring, and then also uh, moving down the line to reviewing the importance of tax planning, uh, considering uh, tax reform that occurred about a year and a half ago, uh, but still having ripple effects with, with a number of taxpayers um, where, where there's still quite a bit of uncertainty out there uh, but we were, we're hoping to shed some light on some some common issues in the industry and then discuss some specific examples where you might want to take away some of these tips and consider for your practice. All right, so just kicking it off for practice structures. I wanted to kind of go over what I've seen uh, during my uh, my career working with with dentists and other and other physicians in regards to how they're structuring the practice, you know, why they're creating multiple entities and doing certain things the way that, you know, their CPAs might recommend or attorneys and kind of just go into a little bit more detail. So typically with a startup dental practice, uh, you, you'll want to have at least an LLC set up for your practice. And why is that? Well, liability is a big point where you want to minimize any kind of uh, potential liability that could flow through to you personally. And then also um, reporting as well. So you want to report that separate from your, your, your personal income. So usually it'll be held within a single member LLC reported on your schedule C or reported as a partnership. If you own it with another doc or potentially as an S corporation. So those are typically, the most common that, that we see for those initial startup operations. And if you purchase the real estate in the building where you're operating out of, you want to place that inside of another single member LLC or potentially a multi-member LLC to avoid any of that liability that, that I just mentioned uh, from spreading from your practice to potentially hitting your, your building. So keeping those, those, uh, those two vehicles separate is pretty important. So as, as dental practices mature, you know, some dentists might want to move down that group practice ownership. Um, and what that means is, all right, we have our, our mature practice in uh, location A, but we see an opportunity in location B and we want to start up a, a, new, a new practice. Well, it, it's pretty key to keep that separate from that first practice legally. Uh, again, for that liability purposes, but then also tracking revenues and expenses. One of the issues I see with folks who are opening practice number two, they, they continue running operations through their, their first practice. And so if you're trying to determine the profitability of that practice and how you're doing and, and running metrics, it's hard to do that when everything's reported on one profit and loss statement or one balance sheet. So it's pretty darn important to, to keep that, that separate. And, and make sure you're tracking things separately, just so you have that transparency and that, and that clarity. And moving down, down the line. Another thing that I do see sometimes with those practices is at the point that you add another person into those practices, you may decide that that's, they're gonna have some ownership in it. So having the structure set up allows other owners to get into those other locations as you're getting going. Right, right. Good, good point, Stacey. Yeah, begin with the, the end in mind. Um, that's what I recommend. You know, want to keep, you want to stay flexible for, for the future, um, considering, you know, potential changes in your business down the road. 
some considerations to think about, you know, as you're structuring your practice and, and judging profitability. And if you sat through other webinars, uh, you might have you heard some of the same points uh, in regards to, are you currently budgeting? Are you, do you know what you're spending on your supplies? Is it, you know, is that an appropriate percentage of your overhead? Uh, could you lower it somehow by negotiating with, you know, your, your suppliers out there? Uh, are you forecasting uh, and seeing how you're going to be doing next year? Are you hitting your forecasts and your goals and your budgets? You know, a lot of the time folks kind of just operate on the, on the fly and, and they're, you know, they're just so busy with their practice. They're not, they're not focusing on these key metrics that could help them improve their profitability. Um, and what does your balance sheet and PNL tell you? Your balance sheet's essentially, you know, what you own and what you owe. Uh, but you know, what else does it talk to you about? Uh, PNL. So how profitable is your, is your company? What's your overhead? Uh, how do you measure EBITDA? What does EBITDA mean? Uh, so a lot of these things are, are, are factors to consider. Um, as you're operating your dental practice and, and really talking to your advisor and working with them to make sure that you're running efficiently and uh, not only from operations perspective, but also tax perspective. So I wanted to dive into tax reform briefly and talk about the impacts to, uh, to this industry. So the, the Reform Act was pretty much the biggest tax reform in the last 30 years since 86. And so the big push was that corporate rate cut, which brought it down to 21% from the mid thirties. So that's a permanent rate cut, but the, all the individual changes and all these pass through changes like S corporations are and other partnerships, uh, those are all temporary uh, changes. So those expire actually in 2025. So the, the time is ticking to take advantage of some of these benefits because they don't last forever. And then the tax code will revert back to how it was back in 2017. So uh, the, the tax cuts are essentially temporary. So just keep that in mind. So here's a good table to compare. All right, well, if the C corporation's rates are 21%, should I switch to a C corporation? Well, not so fast because as you see the prior law, it was 50% compared to you know, 40% uh, if you held it through a pass through. But with the act that passed, you know, there is the potential where you could substantially lower your, uh, your business income to about 10 percentage points still lower than the C corporation. So there is still benefit to being a pass through and you shouldn't really make any hasty moves to switch to a C corporation unless you know, it's the right situation for, for your circumstances. So the way that uh, Congress really got this through and, and, and passed was to keep that parity between, you know, how all the taxpayers were filing previously. There was substantial pass through taxpayers uh, compared to C corporations because of that double tax uh, hit when you're operating as a C corporation. So to keep that parity, uh, they passed what's called 199A, which is a 20% deduction for pass through business income but it's not so cut and dry. And there are planning opportunities there to help maximize your benefits from this, this new deduction. So what 199A is, is a pass through deduction that allows you to essentially take say $100,000 of business income and only be taxed on $80,000 of that. But there's phase outs and limitations and thresholds to, to be aware of to make sure that you're not being impacted by, by any kind of limitations. And also there are industries where you know, we might not see the benefits of these deductions because we're excluded as uh, apparently the, the, not so, uh, the not so blessed in front of the IRS uh, eyes of being eligible for the deductions, such as accountants, attorneys, uh, doctors, and so forth. This is the phase out threshold for 2019, as you see, where the limitations start kicking in. So if you're below that $321,000 married finally jointly, uh, you're not impacted by those phase outs and those thresholds. So, but if you're above that, then there is the potential that you could be limited with that deduction, which is, is pretty important for what's called specified service trades or businesses, which are dental practices. And one thing to note on there, the phase out starts at that 321. You've got another $100,000 before you 
completely lose that that 20 percent on a mailery filing joint return so there is some things that you can can do to try to stay under that right right good point stacy and so what is the qualified trader business which is eligible for that 20 percent deduction well it, it's all businesses except for specified services and like i pointed out earlier health law accounting performing arts and so forth are considered specified service trades or businesses so these are the ones where if you're over that threshold that Stacy mentioned, there is a, another hundred thousand, you're over that say $420,000 threshold. Well, specified, specified service trades or businesses are completely phased out from capturing um, the 20% deduction. So the key here is how do we lower your income so we can be eligible for that 20% deduction as a specified service trade or business. So one thing to remember is if you're running a dental practice and you're paying yourself a wage, um, those wages that you're paying yourself are not eligible for that 20% deduction. But that doesn't mean you should completely drop your, your salary that you're taking home because there are the, still the reasonable compensation factors that are in place in front of the in front of taxpayers and the IRS, which Stacy will touch on briefly in a bit. Um, and there's also other factors to consider with that reasonable compensation. One of the other items to consider is, do we have a building that's owned by the doc? Is, are there strategies to consider where maybe we reorganize and change the structure of the dental practice where we can keep that building income as eligible for the 20% deduction if we are over that threshold? So there are some strategies there where you can't, you're, you don't have to be completely phased out. We could consider some other methods to potentially capture that deduction. And so here's kind of the common, uh, the common structure of, of the practice, similar to what I talked about earlier. And, and what a lot, of, a lot of practitioners out there were, were talking about before regulations were finally passed about a year ago um, with attorneys and accountants and, and doctors is, okay, well, let's take out that bad income that's essentially, um, you know, practicing on patients and you know, moving it to a separate entity and taking out our, our billing function, our marketing, uh, the real estate and, and moving that over to a different entity. Well, that still wouldn't be eligible for the 20% deduction because it's considered all under one umbrella, under that common ownership. So they really cracked down on that and said, no, you can't split everything out and consider it different revenue sources. It's all under common ownership. Uh, but like I was mentioning earlier, there are some gray areas in the law where maybe we talk about reorganizing if it, if it makes sense and it's for legitimate tax purposes and, and business purposes where we could potentially capture that 20% deduction from other revenue streams. And so like I talked about earlier, there are limits on this 199A deduction. Um, those limits are 50% of wages. So if you make $100,000 in the business, but you only pay say $20,000 in wages, well, if you were impacted by those phase out thresholds, we're capped at 50% of wages, which is $10,000. So rather than 20% of 100,000 being our deduction, uh, which would be $20,000, we would only get the $10,000 deduction because it's capped at 50% of wages. And then the second th phase out threshold, which typically doesn't apply to this industry because the wages are so substantial with uh, hygiene and dental assistants and then also office admin. I haven't seen this impacted at all in this industry. So typically the phase out threshold to be careful of is that 50% of W-2 wages. That brings us to our first polling question. All right. Looks like most folks got the got the right answer. So I think we're going down the right track. I haven't confused everybody completely yet. So we're going in the right direction. All right. All right. Two back to back here. Second poll. Right. Qualified property is um, depreciable property held by the business at the end of the taxable year whose depreciation life has not expired by the end of the taxable year. True or false? And that's part of that other phase out threshold that I didn't cover completely as, uh, as typically that first one is one we're impacted at. Got the good answer there. All right. All right. So I think we're still going down the right path. All right, moving on. So we'll go over a couple of those examples briefly. So uh, 
this is similar to what I was mentioning earlier. So say Steve is a married dentist and his business income is $100,000 from his practice and his taxable income, considering other sources such as dividends and wages and so forth is $150,000. Well, what's his qualified business income deduction? Well, take that $100,000, multiply it by 20%, which is a 20% deduction, that gets us $20,000. And so since the taxable income is under that threshold, the wage limitation does not apply. And so that deduction is equal to that 20% of qualified business income. So he's effectively paying tax on only $80,000 rather than the full $100,000 of income from the practice. So going down that same line of limitations and thresholds, there's another one where if your taxable income is is lower than your qualified business income, that's another limitation that you might be impacted. So uh, same situation, Steve's a married dentist, his ordinary income from his practice is $100,000, but his taxable income is only $76,000. So 20% of 100,000 is that $20,000 as mentioned earlier, but then the taxable income limitation, it's capped at uh, $15,200 because it's smaller of uh, either 20% of QBI or 20% of your taxable income. So the deduction is limited to that lower of the taxable income. And here's a little bit more complicated an example, which we won't go into big detail here because um, I want to keep going down the rest of the presentation, but this is where the deduction is starting to get phased out when you're over that $320,000 of income as a specified service trade or business. All right, so I wanna talk about reasonable compensation because, uh, or actually Stacy's gonna to touch on it in, in greater detail because I get this question a lot from a lot of dentists of, well, what is reasonable compensation? My, my prior CPA told me I need to pay myself $100,000 or $120,000, and I've heard that's reasonable compensation. But you know, it's a pretty gray area, and uh, it's not cut and dry, and it depends on what your duties are in the practice, what you would hire someone off the street to do a similar job to you. And so I'll let Stacy go into a little bit more detail about what is this reasonable compensation. So reasonable compensation is actually an area that the IRS has specifically said they are going to look at. So the IRS kind of comes out with areas that they think are being abused and they decide that they're going to take a little bit more deeper dive into that, that area. And so what it comes down to is saying, okay, if I'm an S Corp shareholder, is what I'm doing going to get me looked at? So if, if, if I'm not paying myself a reasonable amount, what, what really are the consequences of that? And it's just a very time consuming process if the IRS comes back in and says, no, you didn't pay yourself reasonable compensation. You put, should have paid yourself more. You have to go through the whole process of amended returns, both on the business side and on the individual side, as well as the, as the payroll side. You also risk um, penalties and interest and all, all that not so fun stuff if it's considered not to be reasonable. So if we look at what might be a flag, what would get the IRS to actually look at us and say, we're not reasonable in our compensation? If you've been paying yourself a salary of say $150,000 and all of a sudden you start to pay yourself $50,000 but your job duties haven't changed, that's going to be a red flag. If when we fill out on the tax return, there's a sheet in there that details out officer comp and it says how much you've been paid as well as the amount of time that you spend doing that job. If you're spending 100% of your time doing that job and you have a profitable practice, but you're paying yourself 5,000 bucks, the IRS is going to be able to see that and say, well, that doesn't seem reasonable for what we see other practices paying. And you're a service oriented business. So the fact that your guys's job is directly dependent on you means you should be getting appropriately compensated for what you're doing. Another key thing that can trigger it is whether or not on your 1040, you've treated yourself as active for net investment income tax, but then don't pay yourself much because the IRS says, hey, this guy says he's active, but why wouldn't he be paying himself more than that? So 
you kind of have to look at some of the things. Another big red flag is if you take distributions of 200,000 and paid yourself 50,000, the IRS says, uh, no, you guys are kind of playing games. You're trying to avoid having to pay those payroll taxes by taking distributions. We're going to come back in and, and reclassify some of that. So what really is reasonable comp? The unfortunate thing is there's no safe harbor. There is no cut and dry way of saying what you paid yourself is absolutely going to be fine. The IRS comes in and says, okay, we're going to look at a bunch of different factors. And if we look at those factors and it seems like you guys are doing your best, we're going to leave, we're going to leave it alone. So you, you're going to look at how much time are you spending there? What's the industry? Obviously in the, in the dental industry, it's, it's personal service. It's your guys' job doing this as opposed to somebody out selling a product. How much experience do you have? How much would somebody else have to be paid to do your job? If you had, if you had to be gone for a period of time, what would you have to pay somebody to come back in there? And that's something that we can, our firm can help you with finding some of those stats and making sure that you're in those ranges. What are you paying non shareholder employees? What have you been giving out in distributions? All that kind of stuff plays into the final decision. So really, if you guys are reasonable in what you're doing and have a basis for what you're doing, you're going to probably come out okay. But if you try to be greedy and try to manipulate the wage part, you're typically going to run into to some issues. And they, they will find you eventually. Maybe not right away, but eventually they'll probably catch up to you. So, and another thing that people don't think about when they're trying to keep their compensation low for a shareholder is, are you really then able to take advantage of your retirement plan contributions? Because a lot of you probably have set up 401k plans that have a profit sharing or some sort of feature in there. And if you're not getting yourself up to that max compensation amount, you're reducing what you guys are being able to put into those retirement plans. So sometimes having the lower wage affects things besides just compensation. So something to think about and discuss with your, your retirement plan person as well. Yeah, good, good point, Stacey. And, and kind of a good rule of thumb or a good starting point is, you know, if you're going to hire an associate dentist because um, you're expanding, typically most most are paid around 30% of net collections and that, that varies. So that might be a good starting point. If you own your practice, you're the only one uh, doing the clinical work other than hygiene, uh, you know, 30% of collections might be a good starting point and then kind of moving around your salary from there. So that might be a good, uh, good initial uh, point of where to start paying yourself. All right, moving on down the line, bonus depreciation. So this is temporary as well. Um, so I think there's a misconception between what's 179 and how does it work and you know, what does bonus depreciation mean? There are actually two different sections in the code. And so bonus depreciation is actually uh, temporary. As you see there on the table, it's 100% deductible if you're buying a new scanner or chair, um, any of that personal property. That's 100% deductible um, up until end of 2022 and then it gets phased down uh, to lower lower accelerated depreciation amounts so that's what bonus depreciation is and you can use that code section to bring your income actually down to a loss whereas section 179 you can't drive your business to a loss you're typically limited to your taxable income from your company so that's what bonus depreciation is and some of the property eligible for bonus depreciation is uh, property must meet the definition of qualified property, which is uh, very detailed. Uh, but the, the big changes are here is bonus depreciation doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be new to take bonus depreciation on anymore. It actually be used property. So if you buy some new, some new equipment and used equipment, you can take bonus on both of those types of, of property. That requirement that's new um, no longer exists in the, in the code and the property has to be placed in service uh, during a certain date. And this was more applicable to when the, when the reform uh, passed a couple years ago, 
um, that was uh, that was more important because the threshold was was only 50 percent of depreciation was allowable in that first year rather than 100 percent. And so along with that, if you have a build out for your practice, there is a portion of the code which is called qualified uh, improvement property. So what is really beneficial with uh, with bonus depreciation is M 179 actually is uh, qualified improvement property. These leasehold improvements are eligible for um, 179 expensing, but and correct me if I'm wrong, Stacy, but I believe the bonus depreciation is not in place. It's only 179 for qualified improvement property. Yep, you're right. Yeah. So, so there's a glitch right now that you know it's trying to be passed by Congress, and we're still waiting, um, but it's yet to be passed. So, if you have that build out, you can use Section 179 to expense that build out generally, but not bonus depreciation. And one thing that sometimes clients will get a tax return and they'll be like, well, my federal bill looks fabulous, but my state, I owe way more in the state than I thought I was going to be. Some of the states that you guys are probably in haven't conformed to the federal bonus in section 179 limitations. So what happens is the states come back and say, this is how you have to treat anything that you've treated on the federal side for bonus in section 179. We want you to spread it over five years or whatever period of time they've decided. So there is some timing differences when you're talking about your state um, compliance with bonus in section 179 compared to the federal. You'll right. get it, you just have to take it over a longer period of time. Yeah, yeah California is notorious for that and you know, a number of other states kind of have that stepped depreciation. So you kind of lose out via time value of money, but you get that same amount in the end. And so the second area is that 179 deduction. So you, know, you may talk about this with your colleagues uh, in the industry saying, well, I'm gonna take 179 on this equipment. All right, so 179 deduction. So there are additional limits here for uh, claiming the 179 deduction, unlike bonus depreciation. And so being aware of these limits, it doesn't really impact uh, most most dental practices that are they're generally uh, a handful of locations because we aren't really hitting those thresholds of, of putting you know over a million bucks of, of new property in the service each year but there are limitations to be aware of and so what qualifies for 179 well they expanded it with reform uh, so like i said qualified improvement property qualifies um, roofs uh, hvac systems uh, and also security systems and, and fire alarm uh, setups too. And so like I said, some key considerations between the differences is uh, you know, some property might qualify for 179 but not bonus, kind of like that qualified improvement property I mentioned. There are those limitations for 179 and some taxpayers are not eligible for section 179. And so there are some key considerations to determine before you know, making the decision of, okay, I'm just going to take bonus on all of this or I'm just going to take 179 on all of it you should really consult with your advisor and, and make sure that the right choice is being made. The biggest non-qualifying one for section 179 tends to be rental properties. Rental properties for the most part are not allowed to take section 179. So that's where that bonus piece comes into play for those, those properties, so. All right. I guess we didn't dive into that date into detail, but it's uh, September 27th, 2017 it's the, is the right answer. Opportunity zone. So this is, you know, this was pretty quiet until uh, people really started reading the details of, of how beneficial this code provision is uh, with tax reform. So, so what opportunity zones are, are uh, there's certain areas that are designated by each state uh, around the country where, uh, that there needs to be uh, more focus on, on growth in these areas to kind of bring it out of, to say, poverty or, or other types of uh, just lower, you know, lower standards of living in these areas. They're, they're trying to bring more businesses and more, uh, more money uh, to certain parts of, of each state. And so uh, opportunity zones were introduced as a way to bring more businesses, more funding into these parts of the country to help stimulate growth. And so uh, 
what the benefit here is, it's kind of an alternative, something similar to a like kind exchange, but also with a little bit more bells and whistles. So say you have a $100,000 uh, gain from the sale of either stock or a business or so forth, and you don't want to pay tax on that gain. I don't think anybody really wants to pay tax uh, in general. But if you find an opportunity for what's called a qualified opportunity fund, if you put that $100,000 gain into that fund and you leave it there for 10 years, well, you get an immediate uh, step up on year seven of 15% of that gain. So you'd only have to pay tax on $85,000. Uh, that's one of the benefits. And then once year 10 hits, you owe tax on that $85,000. But, but the big benefit here is um, you save that fund, your investment in it grows from $100,000 to $300,000. Well, that appreciation, if you sell that fund, a $200,000 gain, you don't owe any tax on that sale. So there's a elimination of $200,000 of gain that you don't have to pay tax on when you liquidate your investment in that fund. So this is a pretty good opportunity for folks who have large capital gains and also you know, want to reinvest their, their capital into an investment. Uh, never let the tax tail wag the dog. So you always have to be focused that the fund is making a good deal. It's invested in a good area that is prime for growth and, and appreciation. So it's, it's really an unknown that, that not many people have been talking about with tax reform that is a pretty good opportunity. We get uh, a lot of questions on why, why don't I just do a 1031 exchange? And the biggest advantage is on a 1031 exchange, it has to be similar property. This, it, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a capital gain that you have, it, it doesn't have to be a property for property type deal. So, and you get the, as long as you can meet the dates, you get the additional stepped up basis. So a couple of things to think about on that. Right, right. And one of my clients who's a, a dentist, obviously, he, he had a big capital gain from selling a portion of his practice to a new partner and uh, we're talking about a qualified opportunity fund and some opportunities there. Well, right in his area is one of these zones. And so we, we approached him and said, well, let's think about opening, you're gonna open a practice anyways, how about in this zone? And so you know, we're, we're still moving down that line where we're setting up all the you know, legal documents and so forth where if he invests us, you know, at least that capital gain into this new business, this new practice uh, in a town away, well, we can defer that gain and get that step up. And then also when he sells that second practice down the road, um, say he has you know, $500,000 into the practice and eventually sells it to for $1.5 million. Well, that capital gain of a million dollars would be uh, completely eliminated. So it's a pretty good opportunity. It's not just for putting into say like a real estate fund. It's also available for, for you as dentists if you're opening a practice in one of these zones. And you can Google the, the zones pretty easily if you wanna check out on, on, uh, on the internet where these zones are. It's pretty easy to find by just Googling qualified opportunity zones. And you'll be surprised. There's areas that you wouldn't expect to be eligible for it that are eligible for it. So it's pretty nice. The one caveat I would say on the client that I've had go through this process and get it set up is you do have to really make sure that your legal structure is set up correctly. So it, our recommendation would be to find somebody who has worked in this opportunity zone arena when you're getting those legal documents set up just to make sure you get all the steps done correctly. Yeah, and there's lots of testing and additional forms with the tax filings that are pretty darn specialized. Um, we have some expertise in-house actually here in Fort Collins who uh, has been leading the charge for, for I Bailey. So if you have any questions, uh, you can message me after, after the, the webinar. And so another big change was meals and entertainment. Well, entertainment used to be 50% deductible. So say you took a couple of your clients you know, to a baseball game or took them hunting and you wanted to write off uh, the cost of that game for that trip well entertainment is now uh not deductible so that 
that 50% limitation is now 100%. So that's something to be aware of and, and really breaking down your meals, entertainment expenses of, of saying, okay, well, this is actually a staff celebration party. Well, that's 100% deductible. So be aware of what your bookkeeper or accountant or CPA are putting into you know, that meals and entertainment bucket because I want to make sure that we're capturing as much as the deductions as possible, that we're not limiting those deductions to that 50% threshold just right off the bat. From a practical standpoint, setting up a, two separate accounts in your general ledger so that they're coding it there from the get-go means that you can maybe not miss on some of those 100%. So you have a meals and entertainment 100% and then a meals 50% account on your general ledger. All right, brings us to polling question number four. And I didn't wanna confuse everybody with qualified opportunity zone and fund uh, phase out the threshold. So this is kind of a, uh, a crapshoot here. So good luck with this one. I think we've given the hardest polling questions that I have seen in a long time oh. <laughs> in this session. Yeah. Keeping everybody awake today. Might be tougher than the CPA exam. That's right. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll and hear the results. Hey, all right, we got some people on board. Well, uh, on one of the slides, it had 90% of assets invested into qualified opportunity zone, property, or businesses. So looks like three folks got it. All right. So a couple other things just to talk, touch on about reform and, and what you're seeing on your tax returns this year after you're reviewing them with your CPA or taking a look at. Um, that some of the deductions are gone as, uh, as itemized deductions. Um, standard deduction was actually raised. So this is a great benefit for, for taxpayers who might not have been paying a mortgage or had high property taxes or other charitable contributions that might have allowed them to itemize before. Uh, well, standard deduction was, was bumped up to $24,000. And I think it's about 26,000 for 2019. So, so that's a great, great benefit for majority of the taxpayers in the country where say your itemized deductions were only $18,000 before. Well, now you get a standard deduction and you don't have to track your, your itemized deductions because you get this benefit uh, right off the bat. So that was one of the good things that passed with tax reform, helping a lot of taxpayers. A lot of the West Coast and East Coast states were pretty fired up with reform because one of the limitations to help raise revenue was capping your state and local income tax deductions that you take as an itemized deduction. With reform, they put in place that $10,000 ceiling where say you're paying $30,000 in state income taxes as a California taxpayer. Well, you're capped at $10,000 as your amount that you're allowed to take as an itemized deduction. And then that $20,000 is lost. Uh, so that's, that's one of the, the negative impacts of tax reform and, and where they're trying to raise revenue. So for new homes that are purchased uh, after December 15th of 2017, rather than a million dollars of, of debt um, being eligible for the mortgage interest deduction, you're now limited to uh, $750,000 of mortgage uh, debt that you're allowed to take the interest off of. So, so it's really trying to raise revenue from some of those higher income taxpayers where you're losing those itemized deductions on mortgage interest if your mortgage is over that threshold. And then also home equity taken out to you know, purchase cars, uh, you know, fund kids education, you know, that, that interest deduction is now suspended from uh, this period of the tax reforms temporary from 18 to 2025. But if you take that home equity out, and you use it on a substantial improvement of your home, that's still considered uh, acquisition debt where you're eligible for that mortgage interest deduction potentially. So charitable gifts, so say you're taking that standard deduction because you're on that fringe of itemizing, say you have 20,000 or $25,000 of itemized deductions, but you know, the standard deductions $26,000 now, and you know, donating charity is a big priority for you. Well, maybe we consider donating um, to that charity by bunching. So, you know, maybe we take, you know, two years worth of donations, let's give to the charity at the end of 2019, don't donate anything in 2020, and then donate again in 2021. 
So kind of double up in that 2019 year. So you get that benefit of donating to the charity where you're not really under that standard deduction threshold where you're not capturing any of those charitable deductions. So you might've heard about bunching from uh, your advisors or, or other sources. So that's kind of a gist of what bunching means to capture some of those charitable deductions. In the great state of South Dakota, we don't have state taxes. So when they're looking at the $10,000 limitation, they're only looking at real estate taxes for us. So when we do the bunching for charitable contributions, we also have to look at that client and say, are you getting to the $10,000 worth of income tax or real estate taxes as well, or should you be bunching for your real estate taxes at the same time? So depending on what states you guys are in, that's also another one that kind of gets in that bunching category too. So That's great. Great point, Stacy. And then, um, Maybe to add on to that, uh, personal property taxes, so your your car licenses that you're renewing each year, your registration. So uh, something I see missed a lot is uh, not claiming the tax portion of that new license. And it can be pretty substantial, at least here in Colorado. It can be uh, close to $1,000 for some vehicles. So that's something to be aware of as well. So miscellaneous deductions, those are now uh, suspended with tax reform, um, those are not deductible. So some of those, um, some of the tax prep fees where we might wanna consider, okay, is tax preparation uh, more attributable to your Schedule C or your Schedule E rental? Um, so being more aware of, of where we're claiming those deductions and also investment advisor fees. So focusing on, okay, is my advisor, is, this, is, is he charging it through my tax deferred account, my taxable account or, or where are these deductions really being charged to? So being aware of, of what you've claimed in years past and, and maybe how we could focus on improving that for 2018 and 19 and going forward. So exemption, exemptions are now uh, expired or suspended with reform. So that I think is about $4,000 a, a person in previous years. So those are now gone. Uh, until about 2026 when reform expires. But the benefit of having kids, they, they might have been an exemption in years past and, and you're able to uh, claim that $4,000 deduction. Well, since that's gone, well, they bumped up the child tax credit from about $1,000 a kid in years past to, to 2,000. But there are thresholds obviously where you gotta stay under so you don't get phased out. Uh, but that's one of the benefits of of, of or the other side of the coin of losing that exemption well now you get the child tax credit that's increased alimony is no longer deductible by the payor for uh, divorces finalized after uh, 2018 and then uh, it's no longer uh, includable in income by the recipient so i think the irs got tired of auditing folks and trying to determine all right what's alimony what's child support is that person claiming income and so forth. And so I think they, they tried to simpl simplify it here uh, by just making it not deductible and not includable in income right off the bat. Moving expenses are no longer excludable as a benefit that you might pay a doctor to move to your area to hire in your practice. So that would be includable in income for them. So it's no longer a, a non-taxable benefit and it's no longer a deduction for folks moving to a new area to start a job. Unless you're that, a member of armed forces. And that's one that if you've got anybody who's done it in the past, they'll say, well, I got to do it before. You just have to say, sorry, it's no longer there. All right, we'll get through this uh, estate tax and planning implications quickly. We're gonna go through a checklist of items to discuss. Uh, just one thing to note, the exemption increased quite a bit. So estate taxes are assessed on large estates that are over a certain uh, threshold. And it's changed uh, every other year, it seems like, Stacey, um, from my, my history yeah. in this profession. Uh, anywhere from a couple million dollars to now it's uh, almost $11.5 million. So if you're over that threshold, there's a 40% tax on the value of your state, estate over that threshold. So it's something to be aware of if if you're passing down a business between generations or 
or potentially have a large uh, estate worth of investable assets, something to be aware of and talk to an attorney and your, and your tax advisor. All right, so just a checklist of, of items I wanted to run through um, to minimize your liability. Um, accelerated depreciation, as we talked about previously, you know, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. So if you don't need the equipment at the end of the year, you know, don't buy it just for tax purposes. Make sure it makes good business sense. Um, awareness of your taxable income and your income being generated from your business so you can capture that 20% deduction. How can you get under that $320,000 threshold uh, married filing jointly? Well, do you have a defined benefit plan in place uh, or defined contribution plan? You know, what are you doing to keep your income below that threshold? Do you have family working in the business? Well, with a new standard deduction, um, if your kids are really working in your business, you can pay them uh, $12,000 generally um, per, per child, and you get that deduction at the business level, but then they don't have to pick it up as income because you know, they're still under that $12,000 standard deduction. So that's something to think about and consider. I have if, a story on that one, Scott. So oh, please, I had please. one oh. dentist call and say, hey, my partner wants to pay his kid, and this is what he wants to pay him. And I said, well, what does that work out from a number of number of hours? He goes, the kid would have to be working over a thousand hours to pay what we're going to pay him. I said, well, that doesn't, I, I know he's not going to work a thousand hours. I said, so that's not really going to meet the reasonable compensation test for him. He goes, that's what I needed you to say. And they went back and they negotiated something a little more in the, in the reasonable ballpark. So. Yep. So that takes us back to that reasonable compensation. It's not just for payroll taxes, but other areas of, of the code. Um, and if you're going to pay your kid $12,000 for modeling to be on your website, make sure that's a reasonable wage that you find at market rates. So that's a very good point, Stacy. If you're in a state that has an income tax, you might want to consider a 529 plan contribution uh, for higher education. So uh, here in the state of Colorado, we have uh, almost a 5% income tax. And um, if you're gonna be paying state tuition anyways, uh, or college tuition anyways, you might as well contribute it to the 529 plan and then take it out the next day and uh, pay tuition. That way you get that 5% uh, deduction. It's a pretty good benefit. Uh, like I talked about earlier, do you have a retirement plan set up in place where you can defer uh, income until later on? and lower your your income so you can capture that 20 percent deduction so talk to talk to your advisor about a retirement plan health insurance plans in the business you know there's so many different options in the marketplace uh, that, that you can implement uh, one of the great opportunities there is a health savings account where you have this deduction uh, each year i think it's about seven thousand dollars of contributions are tax deductible for 2019 and the great thing about those is uh, you can leave the money in there and say it grows from 7,000 to 20,000 years down the road and you take that $20,000 out and use it for medical purposes. Well, that $13,000 of appreciation is, is non-taxable. So that's a pretty good benefit for, for leaving it in for growth. Home office deduction and vehicles uh, in the business. It, it's hard to justify these for those single practice locations. Uh, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Uh, it's, it's typically more common for multi-practice locations when you're driving between those two, uh, those two spots and then also maybe you're managing the practices and not even in the chair practicing. Uh, that's where the home office deduction might come into play. So that's, a, that's an area that I think some folks take advantage of and maybe they, they shouldn't be. So it's something to be careful of, just like the reasonable compensation. It's a target for the IRS. So just be aware that there is some risk there. Again, meals and entertainment. Like Stacy said, it might make sense to break them down into different buckets on your chart of accounts so you're clear on what's what. Uh, cost segregation study. If you haven't heard about a cost seg segregation study and have had uh, a building you've purchased or remodeled, that's something you should talk to your tax advisor about. It's a, it's a great benefit where you pull in depreciation uh, from rather over 39 years, you pull it into potentially year one. So uh, talk to your advisor about a cost segregation study if you, if you own your building. Uh, if you're gonna implement that retirement plan that we talked about previously, pretty uncommon benefit out there that most folks don't know about. Uh, the first three years you implement that plan, you're potentially eligible for a $500 tax credit. 
for those first three years. And that's $500 each year. So $1,000 of, of, of tax credits. Excuse me, $1,500 of tax credits. And then also if you modify your building to make it uh, accessible uh, for the disabled, well, that's also eligible for a tax credit. So some of these are more uncommon that most folks aren't, aren't aware of. So if you're making changes to your business, just make sure that you know there's there's some awareness that you're eligible for a tax credit potentially. And on some of those, your your preparer may not know what you've actually bought. So like there's some stuff related to chairs and different things like that, that if you don't tell us that they're for a certain demographic of patient or don't provide us with the invoice, it's hard for us to be aware of it. So don't feel guilty about saying, hey, like I've heard about this. Are you making sure that you're right. doing this on a return? Great point, Stacey. Very good point. Um, Roth IRA contributions. Typically, if you're over a certain threshold, you're not allowed to contribute to a Roth IRA, but there's a technique called the backdoor Roth contribution. So I mean, talk to your advisor about that. It's a good way to get into a Roth IRA if you're over uh, those income thresholds. Uh, like we talked about earlier, charitable contributions. Maybe think about rather than bunching, maybe a donor advised fund or a private foundation. Estimated tax payments to the IRS are you know, are you paying in too much and getting too much of a refund each year where it's essentially an interest-free loan to the IRS? Let's make sure that we're not giving them too much too early uh, and keeping the money in your bank and generating that interest. Uh, if you're going to donate to charity, let's think about donating appreciated securities rather than cash. Uh, that's a good way to not have to pay the tax but still get that benefit of a charitable deduction where say you donate $100,000 worth of Google stock and you bought it for $40,000, well, you get a $100,000 deduction and you don't have to pay tax on that spread, that $60,000 spread. So that's a technique that, that's pretty valuable for some taxpayers. Along with maybe you have a couple of dogs uh, in your investable account, let's harvest some capital losses where you can offset some of those gains or potentially some of your ordinary income. And then traditional techniques like deferring income to a subsequent year, maybe prepaying some expenses before year end. Uh, that's a good way to lower your liability so we maximize your, maximize your after-tax returns. So that is all we have for now. Do we have any questions? If you guys do have any questions, you can use the Q&A box located on your menu bar or you can use the chat feature. We also have our presenters' contact information up on the screen if you'd like to contact them. And Stacey, am I able to, or Amy, am I able to see any of the questions come through? Well, there's nothing there right now, so, but yes. Right. Either as clear as mud. Or <laughs> okay, so on, Scott, on your menu bar, there is a Q&A icon. If you click that, it will open up with a box, Got and it. you'll oh. see our first question there. All right, so can I talk a little bit more about home office? So what the home office is, say, say you're a dentist and you're, you're managing a number of practices, you're not practicing on your, your patients anymore, you're not in the chair, and you're essentially working from home. You don't have an office in any of your locations, and really your location of business of generating revenue by managing those practices is in your home. So that room in your house uh, that's designated as a home office, there's nothing else in there. It's not a guest room. It's not a game room or anything else. It's where you're conducting your business and, and managing your business. Well, the percentage of your utilities and repairs and maintenance and other expenses for your house are attributable to that home office. So say 10% of your footprint in the, off in the home is used for your home office. Well, this is general... Uh, kind of a general idea here that 10% of those expenses are deductible for tax purposes rather than just personal expenses. So hopefully that makes a little sense. Um, and you know, if you have just one location, it's hard to justify that you're really generating your revenue from that home office. So uh, it's something to talk to your tax advisor about. And you can shoot me an email if that doesn't make sense or if you want to talk further. Awesome. All right. Well, that seems to be all the questions there. All right. 
thank you to Scott and Stacy, and hope everybody has a great weekend. Thanks everyone for your time. Thank you.